welcome. We have a wonderful conversation ahead of us. Uh, power implications of the 21st century economy. My name is uh, Moises Naim. I'm a senior associate at the International Economics uh, Program at the Carnegie Endowment. And uh, we have a wonderful group of people uh, that have a background both in thinking and doing. These are not just uh, pure thinkers. These are people that have a wide experience trying to transform ideas into action and policies. Uh, to my right and your left is uh, uh, Mike Moore, who is now uh, the uh, New Zealand's ambassadors to the United States. Before that, as you know, he was the secretary general, I'm sorry, the director general of the World Trade Organization. Before that, he was the Prime Minister of New Zealand. And of all, all of his many very distinguished postings, the one that I really like is that he was the minister for the America's Cup. <laughs> uh, and that is something that we should all covet. Uh, welcome. Thank you. Kemal Dervis is now the vice president and director of the Global Economy and Development Program at Brookings. But uh, before that, he was uh, the uh, senior administrator or uh, the, the executive head. What's the actual no name of the UNDP boss? I wish you wouldn't ask that. <laughs> administrator, the which administrator. I don't like. Administrator. <laughs> uh, in, in certain circles, that is called as the boss of the United Nations Development Program. Uh, before that, he uh, was the Minister of the Economy of Turkey. And then before that, uh, a long and distinguished career at the World Bank. Uh, William Shaw, Bill Shaw, is a visiting scholar here at Carnegie. is the co-author with Yuri Dadush of The Reason that actually brings us here, which is this wonderful book called Juggernaut how emerging markets are reshaping globalization. And it's going to uh, guide uh, our conversation and debate uh, today here. Uh, Bill has been uh, with the World Bank for, uh, since 1980. He has written on a wide uh, range of subjects from uh, uh, migration in sub-Sahara to uh, debt relief um, and the corporate uh, Restricting uh, corporate restructurings, and um, as I said, there's a wide variety of, of subjects. Thank you for being here, Bill. And finally, Uri Dadush, who is the senior associate, and he's the, actually the boss of the uh, International uh, Economics Program at Carnegie. Uh, Uri also, uh, before uh, he being here, served as uh, the World Bank Di uh, Director of International Trade. Uh, and before that, the director of economic policy. He is the editor of the highly praised and respected uh, Carnegie International Economics Bulletin that if you are not getting, you should get. It's free, and it uh, has a wealth of very interesting information. You can get it just by clicking on it on the web. Uh, the way we're, we are going to, as much as we can, uh, have, try to have a, a wide-ranging conversation, uh, but it will start with a presentation by Uri Dadush, the, giving us uh, 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 some of the central messages and central themes uh, containing juggernaut. Um, after that, uh, Mike Moore and Kemal Dervis are going to react to that presentation, uh, followed by your Q&As, and then Bill Shaw will also intervene. So uh, why don't we start, Uri, with your presentation? Good morning, everyone, and uh, uh, thank you very much, Moises, for uh, agreeing to moderate this uh, this event and for that uh, uh, for that introduction. It's a particular pleasure uh, to be here on the panel with uh, really very good friends. Uh, all the people uh, on this panel are very good friends and people I've known many years. Um, so, uh, juggernaut how emerging markets are reshaping globalization, uh, a joint uh, work with uh, my colleague Bill Shaw, even though uh, I will be making the presentation. And uh, Bill will come in uh, during questions. Um, start by observing that uh, stagnation, economic stagnation, has uh, characterized human history. Uh, Uh, 
but you could actually take it back to the year zero, uh, recorded economic history shows essentially no advance in either per capita income or uh, population until about uh, uh, 1750, 1800 with the Industrial Revolution, whereupon uh, you began to see some gradual acceleration. Uh, but it is in the last 50 years and in our projections in the next 40 years uh, that the curve becomes uh, extraordinarily steep and uh, 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 particularly per capita income uh, accelerates greatly, uh, but, uh, and the growth of population also continues to be very rapid, which allows us to say that um, uh, at no time in history has uh, uh, world output uh, uh, progressed as uh, rapidly and living standards progressed as rapidly uh, as they have uh, during the current moment, which is why uh, the current moment is uh, very special in uh, economic history, and that's what the uh, uh, book is about. It's actually only recently that uh, catch-up conditions uh, spread uh, from uh, Western Europe and its uh, 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 less, less populated colonies, United States, uh, Canada, Australia, uh, New Zealand, uh, etc. Uh, and uh, uh, Japan was the first non-Western uh, industrializer uh, back in the second half of the 19th century. Uh, but it took another century uh, with the decolonization of East Asia for um, uh, the Japanese miracle uh, to begin to spread to a number of relatively small Asian countries. And it was only in the last uh, 20 years uh, or so uh, with the 25 years with the fall of the Berlin Wall uh, that uh, uh, the largest parts of world population joined into this uh, uh, catch-up process and notably, most notably, uh, but certainly not limited to uh, China and India uh, that together represent uh, about two and a half uh, billion people, uh, roughly 40% of the uh, world's population. When you look forward, uh, the most striking uh, uh, divergence is uh, demographic. Uh, this chart shows you that uh, over the next 40 years, all of the increase of the world population of the world labor force will occur in the developing countries uh, that is the red line. They will add close to 2 billion workers, whereas the industrial countries, uh, this is the green line, will actually see a decline in their, uh, in their labor force. So this is an important driver of uh, the development we expect um, over the coming uh, generation or so. But it is actually, as the book sets out, uh, certainly not the most important driver. Uh, the most important driver is the establishment of conditions that, that allow modern technologies and approaches to spread uh, much more widely and much faster uh, than they have in the past. And that is why total factor productivity growth in the uh, uh, developing countries is expected to grow uh, one to four percent faster uh, than in the uh, industrial countries. Uh, the other important factor driving the growth differential between developing and industrial countries is uh, savings and investment. Uh, savings and investment are about 27 percent on average in the developing countries and are more like 20 percent on average in the industrial countries. And then there are other uh, uh, significant but less important factors, such as the fact that the uh, real exchange rate of uh, uh, in uh, developing countries appreciates gradually over time with the uh, development process. 
combination of these factors means that the balance of economic power is transformed. It is, of course, already being transformed, already today, at purchasing power parity, uh, so at comparable international prices, uh, uh, four of the ten largest e of the seven largest economies are um, uh, developing countries. Uh, China uh, is the second largest economy after the United States. Uh, India is the fourth. Russia and Brazil, sixth and seventh. Our projections, which I hope you look at in some detail, and it will convince you that they are very conservative projections, I think. Um, they, they, they are done very conservatively. Nevertheless, suggest that within a generation or so, a little more than a generation, uh, only the United States among the advanced countries will be uh, in the uh, top seven largest economies. China will be the largest, and uh, India uh, will be uh, number three. And uh, that is what the book is about is about the opportunity and the risks that are associated with this process. And we stress the risks as much as the opportunities. Let me briefly mention the opportunities because they are, by now, uh, quite widely discussed. Um, one big opportunity is that the bulk of the world's middle class will, um, by around 2030, uh, be in the developing countries, whereas today it is uh, overwhelmingly in the advanced countries. So the, the, the group of people that can actually buy uh, consumer products, uh, cars, television sets, etc., will be predominantly in developing countries uh, after around uh, 2030, opening up enormous uh, uh, new markets uh, for uh, firms in uh, the industrial countries, but also in other developing countries, making South-South trade um, even more important and uh, as dynamic as it is uh, today. So that's one opportunity. Another very important implication is the decline of poverty. Uh, poverty essentially becomes concentrated in India and Sub-Saharan Africa, I'm talking about absolute poverty, less than $1.25 a day. And even in India and Sub-Saharan Africa, in our projections, it declines uh, dramatically. Uh, in India and Sub-Saharan Africa today, about 40% or 45% of people live on less than $1.25 a day. By 2050, those percentages are down uh, in the 5 to 10 percent uh, range. Uh, so the opportunities, the economic opportunities implicitly are uh, enormous. But let's talk about um, uh, the risks and let's talk about uh, how, the, uh, uh, how the international community is managing these risks. There are four sets of risks that are discussed uh, at greater or lesser length in the, uh, in the book. Uh, a geopolitical breakdown, financial crisis and depression, protectionism, and uh, uh, climate change. Let me say a word about each of these uh, four types of risks that are associated with the process. We know that uh, uh, the rise of uh, great economic powers have usually, has usually been associated with uh, conflicts, either expansion into far-off territories, the whole process of colonization can be interpreted in that light, uh, for example, or uh, simply uh, fights between neighbors uh, of uh, uh, more or less equal standing where one is moving ahead of the other. And let me give you an example of the tensions. Perhaps the greatest risks for conflict are uh, in Asia itself, although people like to focus, and my colleague Michael Swain this week 
is bringing out a book about the strategic military balance between China and the United States. Uh, but actually, the biggest risk for conflict is within Asia itself. China has, for example, uh, a profound rivalry uh, and territorial differences with both Japan and India. In 1990, uh, that chart shows you the relativities of uh, uh, GDP of uh, China, Japan, and India. Uh, this is what the uh, size is relative size looks like in 2010. Uh, approximately China is the same size of Japan, having been much smaller just 20 years ago, but is already much bigger than India. And in 2050, this is what our uh, projections uh, suggest. Um, China essentially dominating uh, both its uh, uh, traditional rivals in terms of economic power. Uh, and so this is one set of issues uh, that needs to be managed. And while the focus on the book is on the economic aspects of this uh, transformation, nevertheless, one has to bear in mind that the economic aspects are embedded in a strategic balance and that the two are feeding each other all the time and indeed the risks that I'm talking about are closely interconnected in that tensions in one area easily spill over into tensions on the other. Let me talk about the second source of risk, uh, financial crisis. Although the current crisis is in the United States and in the United Kingdom, it makes us forget that financial crises have been predominantly the domain of uh, emerging markets in the past. The uh, yellow area in this chart shows you the incidence of, uh, the incidence of uh, financial crisis in developing countries and the green in uh, advanced countries. Not only have emerging markets had historically much greater incidence of financial crisis. When they hit emerging markets, the financial crisis have a worse impact. They are bigger. And uh, the risk is that now we have giant economies that are being integrated into uh, global financial markets. Think of Brazil today, uh, for example, uh, that have many of the institutional weaknesses uh, that we know are associated with financial crisis. And we know that the institutions that they have are, despite the recent experience, in many respects, even more vulnerable than the very vulnerable institutions that we have in the advanced countries. So a greater risk of financial crisis, this time originating in giant uh, developing countries, ill-equipped to handle them. The third risk is protectionism. It's one thing when the low wage economies are relatively small players. It's another thing when the low wage economies actually dominate world trade, which is what we are projecting by uh, 2050, uh, by far the largest uh, uh, traders. Uh, will be developing countries with an enormous amount of South-South trade, which, by the way, is where the tariffs are highest uh, today and where the protectionism is uh, highest. Um, the uh, influx of so much uh, low-wage competition is bound to create increasing uh, protectionist pressures. And, of course, we're seeing uh, quite a bit of that today uh, with respect to uh, China. Uh, for example. So that's the third sort of risk that could easily uh, abort this process or at least slow it down very significantly. And last but not least is the effect on climate. Uh, essentially by 2050, uh, the uh, majority of the carbon that is in the atmosphere, the stock of carbon that is uh, believed to determine uh, long-term climate change, uh, will be due to developing countries, whereas today 
uh, it is predominantly the result of activity, uh, historical activity in the industrial countries. And at the margin, uh, the big emitters are uh, predominantly uh, going to be uh, developing countries. Already by 2030, the concentration of carbon in the atmosphere will be such that uh, uh, scientists believe could in the long term lead to a two degree centigrade increase in the global temperature. Uh, by 2050, uh, a four degree, which would be increasing global uh, temperature, which would represent uh, catastrophic uh, climate change. Again, uh, these projections are done quite conservatively, uh, both in terms of the underlying growth rates of these economies. So for example, China is projected over the next 40 years to grow at close to 5% instead of 10%, which is what it has averaged over the last 20 years. And it assumes some significant mitigation along lines of a number of agreements uh, that have been reached uh, recently. Nevertheless, you have uh, catastrophic climate change. Uh, so these are uh, the risks associated with the process and uh, 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 achieving deals is going to be complicated, not just because of the enormity of the change that is happening, but also because paradoxically, and for the first time in history, the biggest economies and the most powerful economies of the world will be predominantly relatively poor countries. Uh, so this chart shows that even in 2050, uh, the emerging economies that will be much bigger than they are today and will be the largest economies will remain much poorer than the advanced economies. So China in 2050, even though it is a bigger economy than the United States, is projected to be about one third as rich as the United States, one third uh, in purchasing power terms. Uh, India will be the third largest economy, but it will have a GDP per capita, which is about one tenth that of the United States, um, still in 2050. And per capita income is just a headline of the differences uh, that we are trying to describe. Uh, because uh, alongside these, uh, the difference in per capita income <coughs> come very large gaps in uh, corruption, for example, financial openness, democracy, and environmental performance. This chart uh, shows you uh, the United States today, uh, which is the, the big yellow diamond compared with uh, uh, China, which is the red diamond, and India, which is the green diamond. These are the three largest economies of the world projected in about a generation. And it shows how uh, institutionally and policy-wise there are very large differences between the rich countries and uh, uh, the poor countries. And these differences will lead to very important differences in priorities, in perception, in ability to execute, in willingness to undertake uh, different types of reforms uh, that are necessary uh, in order to manage this process that I am describing. Now, um, the book uh, examines uh, quite systematically trade, the main channels of globalization, trade, finance, migration, and the global commons. And uh, these are the four major ways in which uh, the developing and industrial countries uh, interact with each other in the process of globalization as this historic change uh, happens. And here I have amused myself, I don't do it in the book, we don't do it in the book, uh, by giving grades uh, to uh, uh, our capacity to manage the process in each of the four channels. And uh, uh, the conclusion, and this might surprise Mike more, 
is that having been the Director General of the WTO and initiated the Doha process, uh, that trade, Mike, gets the highest grade. It's still uh, a D. Uh, what? It's still a D. Yeah, it's still That's a B. A it's, it doesn't get a high grade. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't get a high grade, but it gets the highest grade I ever got. in terms of both <laughs> domestic <laughs> policy and in terms of uh, uh, international institutions. Because for all the problems, uh, trade has become more open, largely through unilateral liberalization. And we actually have a process in the WTO where disputes can be settled, where uh, sanctions can be imposed on uh, uh, violators, and where there are a large number of pretty clear rules about what you can and cannot do. Unfortunately, that's where the grade curve collapses because when you go down to finance, uh, how can you, given the experience in the most advanced countries over the last uh, two or three years, give anything but a low grade to both domestic policies and uh, international collaboration on managing uh, financial integration? Migration, uh, the chapter of migration says two things. It says migration is in many ways the greatest economic opportunity that the world faces to increase the welfare of uh, uh, the, the world's citizens. Uh, it is also where the system fails abysmally. Uh, migration is today uh, the law of the jungle. Uh, people do what they want, countries do what they want, there is no serious uh, coordination or restraining mechanism on uh, migration policies uh, with uh, very adverse effects, not just in terms of uh, the global welfare, but uh, the domestic situation in a lot of the uh, receiving um, uh, countries. And on the global commons, you get a failing grade as well. We are nowhere near either on the domestic front or on the uh, uh, global coordination front uh, to find a way to agree on uh, uh, carbon emission mitigation and on uh, uh, some kind of reasonable division of responsibilities across uh, these burgeoning developing countries and the uh, advanced countries. So finally, uh, the, what do you do about this? And this is why the book is not going to sell uh, <laughs> a lot of copies. <laughs> uh, because uh, despite our very, very best efforts, uh, we, we, uh, the best way to summarize it is, Houston, we have a problem. Uh, the, uh, it, the, the concluding chapter says two things that are worth reporting here. Uh, other than saying that the G20 uh, clearly has a role. Uh, one thing the concluding chapter says, and I hate it, but it's a negative conclusion, but it's an important conclusion, is do not rely on big multilateral deals to solve this problem. They're just not capable of doing it. If you really think that 200 countries are gonna get together around the table and agree on detailed mitigation targets, uh, or uh, I, I hate to say it, on detailed trade liberalization. This is 153 countries now in the WTO. It just is not gonna happen. Uh, or if it happens, it'll be an incredibly diluted uh, document. So it is very important that deals be struck among a critical mass done in a way that they can be extended to a broader group so as to retain their legitimacy as well as their efficacy. And these groups don't have to be the same. They can vary depending on the issue, depending on the size of the country and its effect on that particular question. Although obviously, you know, United States, China, and India are likely to be part of uh, most deals. And the last thing uh, that uh, the book says is uh, uh, it's 
there is no substitute to increasing awareness uh, in individual countries of these issues. We call it establishing a global conscience. Why is there no substitute for that? Because essentially, power remains concentrated in the sovereign nation uh, today and is likely to remain concentrated in sovereign nations any time in the foreseeable future. So unless the sovereign nations, and particularly the big players, are conscious of the impact of their decisions on this uh, global transformation, uh, we are not going to have uh, the progress needed in order to uh, mitigate these risks. And here, international dialogue contributes uh, to creating a global conscience at the national level if it is done right, but it cannot determine the outcomes. The outcomes will be determined in Washington, Beijing, Delhi, and Berlin, and Tokyo. Uh, they will not be determined in Geneva or at the United Nations in New York. Thank you. Uh, Uri, for a very interesting presentation. Uh, Mike, what, what's your reaction to what you had just heard? Well, firstly, um, the authors of Nile, the book, it's very good. Um, perhaps I should explain a little bit about myself. Um, I'm now the New Zealand ambassador here. It's the first time in 40 years I've had a boss, and I, therefore I have to be a bit careful of what what I say. Um, I wish I could get every member of my cabinet and parliament to read the book. I shall certainly send extracts around. Um, it's a melancholy fact uh, that we have to keep repeating and repeating and repeating uh, our core message. And when we're sick of saying it, someone else has heard it for the first time. Uh, the authors point out we've created more wealth in the last 50 years and the previous 500. We lifted hundreds of millions of people out of extreme poverty. Uh, and when you realize that we're going to see more change in the next 10 years than in the previous 50, you realize how big the challenge is. And those with power and privilege seldom surrender it in history without a struggle. And of course, the anti-globalization forces I have no model to report on, no example they can point out of where they can do better. And the problems explained in the book uh, and the evidence presented to us again reinforces the fact it's not globalization that's a danger to the poor, it's the absence of globalization and the great moral challenge, uh, economic challenge, and maybe even security and environmental challenge of the next 20 or 30 years is how you bring another 2 billion people out of the shadows into the global economy where they can be consumers and hopefully citizens. And the darkest and most difficult and unpleasant places on the planet are those that are the least open. So the book does bring home uh, and is a slap in the face and a wake up call and a reminder uh, that if we're going to live by evidence, uh, we'll read the evidence of how dramatically uh, the world is going to ch is changing. It's not that it's going to change, it has. And to remind ourselves that uh, the bricks uh, lack cement, uh, that the issues we're facing are as much south-south now uh, as north-south. And if we're going to have shape our future, we're going to have to get on top of this. Um, we go back to core principles. Uh, and the core principles are these, that the world without walls is, cannot be a world without values, standards, and accountability. And a free market without standards, rules, values is not a free market. It's a black market and a dangerous jungle. The truth is that our institutions um, cannot cope. Uh, the world is moving quicker than our moral, legal, institutional capacity uh, to cope. In the main, uh, this is a healthy 
and good thing. Anyway, we're not going to stop it. It's a question of how it's harnessed to good. Um, Kamal complained that he was called the administrator. I was called the director general. I was not a director, and even less was I a general <coughs> at the WTO. Um, but good people can navigate their way through this. Um, and I think we're capable of stumbling into the future. Uh, but my God, it would be a, tr a splendid thing uh, if we didn't stumble, uh, that we navigated, and we accepted the realities of these changes and were part of them. And my fear is uh, that we will not harness uh, these changes in the way we harnessed and harvest uh, these changes to all our benefit. And um, there are a lot of our dear friends in the poorest countries face being locked out. Uh, and it's not north versus south now. It's equally south versus south. Anyhow, I look forward to um, uh, dodging questions uh, later on. Uh, but anyway, congratulations to the book. Huh? It's good. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. It is very, very good. Thank you, Mike. Came out. Well, I, it is a great book. I think, it, it, I think uh, there's one dimension I believe it misses, and I'm going to come to that. But with most of it, I agree. The picture, the analysis, it, it also has some real quantitative analysis behind it, the appendix on, on, you know, on the projections, on the, on the model uh, that uh, leads to the figures, I think is, is a good one. You know, it's a rough one, of course, but in, that, in this kind of enterprise, perhaps that's the best one can do. I think um, in terms of the convergence dynamics, the growth rates and so on, I would, I would argue that um, uh, the real exchange rate appreciation may well be stronger than what's projected. Uh, I think historically uh, one has seen examples of that. Japan is one very critical case. One has to remember, you know, constant growth rate in, in, in domestic uh, prices plus real exchange rate appreciation leads to the shift in weights. And I do believe that there's probably even more scope for real exchange rate appreciation than what's in the projections. I believe that if you looked at the Chinese real exchange rate today, it's already ahead of your projections because of yes. inflation in China. And so that's, and th that's just one example. But otherwise, I think, um, you know, I, I, I agree with the, with the overall picture. Now, there's one tension um, in the story and also, in, I, I think, in, in the presentation. And I'm going to you know, focus so that there's some discussion, not on all the things I agree with, but on the things where, where I, I believe there's, there's some need for further discussion. And that is, you know, one projects these numbers, these growth rates, and then there are these problems that Uri in, in his presentation emphasized. But there's really no quantitative link between the degree to which one manages these problems versus the projections. To some degree, the Stern review on climate change, I think, had the same problem because it projected vigorous growth right. and potentially catastrophic climate change. So, you know, what, what you kind of say, what Uri said in the projection is, well, this is the potential, these are the opportunities, this is the growth. But then, of course, there could be very bad developments, which obviously would have an impact on the growth. If they don't, they're not very bad in, in that sense, okay? So, I mean, in the future, I think when we do work on all these things as, as, a, as a group of people interested in globalization and, and, and devel development, somehow we have to build um, quantitative links between the policy constraints and the actual outcomes. You know, otherwise, we, we're left with a kind of funny situation where you know, we have these very high growth rates projected and then very big problems, but no, no real link between the two. Now, there's one dimension, I think, which is missing. I mean, the four dimensions, uh, you know, the four problem areas outlined, the four constraints, I, all, I, I agree they're all uh, very important. I do believe the climate change and natural uh, resource constraint in the long run you know, is probably one of the most important ones. But there's one thing that's missing in the story, in my view, and that's income distribution. Mm. Okay. What, because you know, in, in this whole story of globalization, there's one element which we're seeing in most countries, not all, which is very disturbing. And it's not income distribution across borders. There is convergence in mean incomes across continents and major countries now in, in a very uh, you know, remarkable way and a positive way. But it's income distribution within 
major countries. And here, the change is really quite dramatic. I mean, the US is, is of course, one key example uh, of, of income concentration at the top that is really uh, impressive, incredible. I mean, the top 1% went in the last 30 years from 8% to 24%. Now, when you think of that, from 8% to tripling the share, I, I think you know, it's, it should be a wake-up call. Uh, similar trends one can see in China, a completely different system, but again, with, uh, with, a, with a exploding income inequality, somewhat less in India, but going in the same direction. Europe has resisted that for a long time, but I think in the last decade is joining the trend. Latin America is an exception. In Latin America, there, ha there actually have been some improvements, and that's a very interesting uh, point of analysis. But overall, massive concentration of income at the top, and in the US, for example, stagnation of median income of individuals. Not of households, because women have joined the labor force in a, in a very uh, uh, big way over the last three decades. However, that cannot continue. I mean, we've now reached a point where you know, uh, that, that cycle has, has played itself out. Now, when we look at the reasons for that, the mechanics behind it, the dynamics behind it, there's no particular indication that this will stop. On the contrary, the same factors, technology, weakening of unions, um, to some degree, uh, trade and, and globalization, you know, in, in, in terms of lower income uh, wage competition. I mean, you know, the relative, the relative weight of these factors can be debated. But all these things are likely to continue. And if we extrapolate the trend in the US, we could find ourselves in a decade with 1% of Americans commanding one third of national income, which ne we've never seen before, even at the time of the you know, robber barons in the, and, and in the last century and, 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 and the 1920s. Like, like Andrew Carnegie, for example. <laughs> for example. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure about Brookings, yeah, yeah. <laughs> not sure about Brookings <laughs> but anyway. So I think this is one dimension that I think needs to be added to the analysis. Because, because it, it, ha it will have a major impact on politics, on the political economy of the whole process, it has impact on policy, tax regimes. I mean, three examples, you know, what is, a, what is an American or a French corporation these days? Um, we, we all saw that uh, General Electric, which you know, we all believe is an American corporation, President Obama even chose the CEO as one of his key advisors on, and then managed not to pay any taxes to the US Treasury. Uh, uh, Coca-Cola now, you know, when you go to Atlanta, it's a, obviously a very Georgian company, but t only 18% of its sales are in the US. And I found out in last week in France that Danone, which is a French you know, company, only 10% of its sales are in the US and only 2% of its profits are in the US. So there's a tremendous globalization of the corporate world. At the same time, I think um, there is you know, the immobile, unskilled labor, the people who are stuck, and they are stuck. In, in many parts of the world, you know, and, and particularly in advanced countries. So coming from an emerging market, one feels happy about the fact that, you know, you, you stressed it that so many hundreds of millions are lifted out of poverty. But from the point of view of political economy, the fact that in, in Europe, in Japan, and in, in, in the US particularly, large, hundred, you know, large numbers of people feel stuck in absolute income and worse in relative income, I think is already having major impact on, on, on politics and on how these people view globalization and relate to globalization. So that would be uh, the, the dimension that I, I think needs to be added to the analysis. Thank you, Kim. If I could add one little thing too. Sure. Um, I was going to do this question time. Uh, if looking at risks um, and things that could go wrong, uh, the world of Islam is worth a chapter, along with Africa looking at demographics and those people whose faces are pressed against the window, uh, that is going to have impacts upon us all. Yeah. But hey, nine out of ten is better than I've ever got for any of my books. Thank you, Mike. I, I know you two must be very tempted to react, but why don't we take some questions okay. and then uh, you, you have an opportunity. So your, 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 your time, but go ahead. Just tell us who you are and uh, which institution are you with. Here, please. And then the lady in the back. 
Uh, uh, yes, Kimberly Elliott with the uh, Center for Global Development, and I just want to, to follow on Kamal's comments. I had exactly the same reaction, and just to pull some numbers that I think, if I got them right from your presentation on the numbers and distribution of the upper and middle income classes, I mean, it looked to me from your own projections that oh, you should have chart showing extreme poverty declining sharply, but overall, those in the lower income bracket only falling from maybe around a third to a quarter, if I calculated it correctly. So that seems very modest, again, given the growth projections. And so I would just underscore what Kamal said, that I would think that's a pretty big risk. And also to connect what he said about GE and the corporations, it seems to me one of the potential policy recommendations. I mean, here in the US, we're having a debate over tax policy that is ideological, but the whole role of progressive taxation is one issue. But then globally, you have the issue of the ability of corporations and, and the rich to move their assets around a low tax haven. So it seems to me tax policy is another potential area where we need some global cooperation. Thanks. Thank you, Kim. The lady in the back, please. Uh, there is a termination formally from uh, the IMF. Um, Uri, and, uh, Bill, congratulations on a really interesting book. Um, I would like to ask uh, you to elaborate a little bit on the role of domestic policies, particularly in the emerging market uh, countries, in ensuring that sort of the good scenario that you are foreseeing here uh, does actually materialize. You mentioned the uh, institutional weaknesses as a possible risk uh, leading to financial crisis. Um, I mean, uh, can you talk a little bit more about the role of financial policies, fiscal policy, the interplay between uh, uh, income distribution, politics, and uh, the you know, stance of, uh, uh, of policies, in particular of fiscal policy? Thank you. Let's take, um, I think the general moniker of all these questions, uh, Uri and Bill, has to do with the notion that you are underestimating accidents. There will be all sorts of accidents, uh, either in fiscal policy or domestic policy, or um, <coughs> Kim's points, or uh, Kemal's and, and, uh, points about income distribution, Mike Moore's uh, points about his pessimism about the possibility of coordinating action to minimize instability. All the points, all the questions have one thing in common. And that is that your projections are wrong. <laughs> because they are underestimating accidents. Well, there have been a lot of accidents over the past 30 or 40 years. And the world seems to be progressing relatively well. So I'm not sure the fact that there are tensions means that forecasts are, are unachievable. Um, actually, I thought we were we were fairly gloomy on balance since we emphasized all the things that could go wrong. And it is, it is hard to tell a very complicated story about relating each thing that goes wrong to where the projections might not be realized. So it's, we were telling a simpler story, which I think was, was probably necessary. Uh, one thing I'd like to talk a little about is income distribution, which I think is, uh, Kamal is quite right. And it's a fascinating point. And, and for me, it represents one of the great failures of the Western democracies over the past couple of decades. And I'm just trying to look for some uh, bright spot in the gloom when you, when you look ahead. And one bright spot is that um, the deterioration in income distribution has represented this huge influx of, sorry, has been driven by this huge influx of uh, workers into the global economy, low wage workers. And as education spreads in the developing world, a lot of these workers are going to become much more educated. And you're actually, I think, are beginning even to see now some shift in the uh, supply of skills. So you may have more skilled workers coming on stream, which will be good news for income distribution, I think, uh, in the advanced countries, at least as between low-skilled low and high-skilled workers. It may not be good news at, in terms of uh, capital versus labor viewed as a group. But I think the income distribution in the future is, uh, is a complicated story. And one we'll have to write about, I guess, in, a, in our next book. Um, I think we were writing another book that definitely the income distribution story and the, and the issues of uh, ethnic and religious tensions would, of course, uh, play a big role if we were going to look more, as we did not in this one, at what's going on within the, uh, within the countries themselves. Um, I think one of the great disappointments is we have not seen this easing of ethnic and, and religious tensions as a result of globalization that you might have thought about in theory. Thank you, Mill. Yes, the gentleman in the back. 
thank you very much. My name is Yaya Fanusi. I'm the lead person for, we don't use the word director or chief. I'm the lead for the Special Operations Division of the United States of Africa 2017 project. On May 25th at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, there was a presentation, and I hope, I wonder if Yuri and your co-author are aware of a, a report authored by University of Colorado and South Africa Institute of Strategic Studies, something like that, called Africa 2050. If you're not aware of it, please. Africa 2050? Yes. Yeah. Are you aware of that yes, report? We are aware of that. Okay. It's yeah. very interesting. Yeah. Thank you. L let me use that, that question to, to raise another issue for you, and that is to try to unbundle your unit of analysis. You have uh, called it emerging markets, you call it uh, developing countries, you call it poor countries in, 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 in different points of the book and in the presentation and also in the reactions. What we're talking about has been described in very different ways. There are BRICS, there are poor countries, there are developing countries, there are emerging markets. And we know that this uh, basket includes uh, very different kinds of uh, species. You have uh, different countries, different groupings of countries uh, that uh, vary by performance. You have the fast growing uh, superstars and the stagnating, declining countries. You have countries that are different in terms of their integration with the rest of the world. You have the high globalizers, the deeply integrated countries, and the ones that are more closed. Uh, you have the very large population countries uh, and, and the ones that are more scantily populated. As uh, it was mentioned here, you, you also have the Islamic countries that have their own challenges, Africa, uh, and so on. So, could it be that you are putting in the same basket too diverse uh, a, a set of uh, uh, speci specimens and that you will need to unbundle that basket and that, that, that package? Well, if we're doing that, it certainly would be a mistake, I think. It's certainly a, much, a very diverse uh, group. One thing we say, we point out in the book, is that the difference in income per capita levels uh, within the industrial world is, is small, in fact, minuscule, compared to the difference in income distribution, income per capita levels among countries within the developing world. And if you're looking at the global picture, then uh, somewhat unfortunately, it really is a story of the, of the BRICS and Indonesia and Mexico uh, and maybe uh, a few Latin American countries and maybe South Africa. Um, fast growing, so it's Fast growing large. Um, one thing we also talk about is whether Africa can join this group. And there, I think, we, we say it's possible with so many uh, hedges and qualifications that one, one almost loses credibility. It's, it's difficult to envision. Any other question, comments? Yes, sir. Well, let's wait for the microphone, please. Thank you. Tell us who you are. You, uh, my name is Randall Doyle. I'm a Franklin Fellow at the State Department uh, in East Asia. Um, I haven't been in East, lived in East Asia or Asia Pacific for 10 years of my life. Um, and seeing this region now becoming literally the arena of primary action in the world, especially economically, uh, one of the questions a lot of people are asking in that part of the world is um, the expectations of what we call the middle class, merging in the middle class. But obviously these individuals are aware they're not going to live the kind of standard of life that exists in the United States and Western Europe. But having said that and everything, um, do you think that the international institutions that are in place now are going to be able to to deal with the issue of the allotment, redistribution, not only of income, but of resources itself. And as all these prices, food and energy and whatever are going up, and from all estimations there could continue to go up, um, is there in place within the international community uh, the ability to deal with these, these type of issues? Because I, I think that uh, you were talking about accidents. You were talking about accidents. So I think one of the accidents occur is, uh, and I think the Doha round of trade is a good example of this accident, is the inability to come to some kind of resolutions or, or solutions uh, to a world that is becoming incredibly competitive and aggressive in making sure that their national interests are taken care of, especially in the arena of resources. And I wonder if we have the capability right now in the world to deal with these evolving and developing issues? That's a great question, and we already know uh, their answer. They already gave grades to that uh, question. But let, but let me he hear from people who have been in charge 
of uh, organizations that have to deliver on that front. Why don't I ask Mike Moore and Kemal Dervish to give us a brief reaction to that very good point? Yes and no. Uh, we have the capacity to do this thing. Whether we'll do it is up to us. So the one, one part in this book and other books where I get a little tetchy is someone says the WTO should do this or the United Nations should do that. Well, that'd be great. Uh, but you can only do what the members allow you to do. And it would be very dangerous if the WTO somewhere would say, do that. Uh, we can only do what the membership allows us to do. However, the trade got a C, um, because curiously enough, uh, the WTO is not a UN agency, uh, does work by consensus. It doesn't have a Security Council. Everybody has a veto. I mean, we almost came to our knees at Doha over Bulgarian yogurt um, that anybody can stop you. That's good and it's bad. It's a question of your political skills in navigating it. So the WTO, curiously enough, and the Doha round uh, does reflect the new reality. Uh, China and India are game changers and game stoppers. Uh, and uh, there is no executive committee, there's no weighted vote, uh, so we can get over those things. This round can actually still be done. <coughs> um, but our problem, I've got to be careful because I always want to be constructive and helpful. Um, the trouble is, uh, history is sped up, sped up. And if it, in the old days, taking 10 years may have been OK. Um, but 10 years now is not 10 years. You look at the Fortune 500 when we launched the round, the Fortune 500 now. Uh, look what's on the table. Uh, you start the round, Brazil is a, a beef importer now. Brazil is the world's greatest ex beef exporter, and she's got foot and mouth. Uh, Facebook didn't exist. Uh, hit the economic history sped up, and the services sector pillar, uh, which will make this thing work, uh, is not strong enough. And bluntly, if I get down to raw figures, uh, which you need in this town, uh, you're walking around talking about a Doha deal for America that's worth one day's trade. It ain't enough. And is south-south. Uh, Brazil having problems with China, more than US does, more than any of us have. And then it comes to issues like currency. And um, if you're running at 10% growth and 7% growth, what real incentive is, you, is there for you to say this is not good enough? Uh, it's a question of um, countries stepping up to the plate. I know that's easy to say. Um, and navigating it through. I can actually see, in my mind, how this damn thing can be done. Um, but, you know, deals fall over because of the definition of catfish, uh, cotton, coffee, and things that are tragically small in the big scheme of things. Thank you, Mike. Come on. Well, I guess the un one of the underlying aspects of the, of the very good question is you know, to what extent uh, globally will price changes related to natural resources be acceptable? I mean, basically, I think overall the world economy works through the price system and resources will be priced. Uh, and I think there are two, <coughs> two problems here, I mean, two potential problems. When the prices result in resource transfers that become politically very difficult to manage, we may have a problem. But I'm amazed at how the international system, in a way, accepts these changes. I mean, you know, the oil price, who knows, 10 years from now, maybe in real terms, will be at $200 a barrel. The Some very uh, <laughs> sparsely populated oil exporters will reap huge benefits from that. But um, you know that is kind of overall accepted. Now, I think if it remains within certain bounds, that will continue. And, and, and the price mechanism, of course, will generate investments in resources and will generate responses that will make it make supply larger. Uh, so I mean, I, I have some confidence that that system works, although it does create amazing inequalities that somehow don't seem fair. The other element is the volatility. And I think here, one of the big debates 
is whether the financial sector and derivatives and all that actually contribute to higher volatility or not. And I, I would tend to think that the evidence is that they do actually generate more volatility rather than the opposite, which the proponents of the financial sector had argued that you know arbitrage would actually be helpful. In fact, it seems that the herd instincts and the and the financial products uh, lead to greater volatility. So some um, effort to reduce volatility, I think, is, is also on the agenda. But I, 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 I don't think we'll go to a system where you know, resources are quantitatively allocated. I think we will remain within the basic market price system. And what we can do is, is work on the volatility side. Thank you. Any more? Sir? Sir. Uh, Keith Henderson, American University. Um, uh, look forward to reading the book uh, very much. And uh, my question, though, I'd, I'd like to pick up on the issues of income distribution and corruption. Um, it seems like if you accept uh, uh, Mr. Derville's uh, notion that uh, income redistribution is one of the key uh, factors to focus on, that, and when you look at the countries, they're going to become the top seven. Um, when you look down that list uh, by 2050, um, almost all of those countries are deemed to be among the most corrupt in the world now. Um, so if you try to think about what can be done, you know, about that issue, how does that issue impact uh, income redistribution, particularly people at the grassroots level? Um, what is the, what can be done to manage that problem? Or do you think that these most corrupt countries in the world now are going to grow out of that uh, endemic corruption? Um, um, uh, what should we be thinking about with regard to those countries and corruption and income redistribution, uh, particularly, again, at the grassroots level? Thank you. Uri, I think you should take that question. I should. <laughs> I thought he was asking Kamal the question. Or was it you, uh, were you asking Moises me? Moises is the moderating, oh. so. <laughs> uh, um, do, do I think those countries will go out of corruption? Um, I was going to say, in answer to a previous question, that it's actually quite amazing, and unfortunately, Teresa, I now had to leave. Uh, it's actually quite amazing to me how big the improvement in policies of developing countries that you can measure has been over the last uh, 10, 20, 20, 30 years. I mean, if you look at trade policy, the, the, the tariffs have come down enormously. It's a much more open system. Uh, and if you look at macroeconomic policy, there's been a, 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 an enormous leap forward in the quality of macroeconomic management in developing countries. And, uh, this is one of the reasons that uh, uh, the financial crisis has affected them less. And, and, uh, uh, and this includes, by the way, improvements in financial regulation. They, there are still enormous weaknesses. But in Asia, for example, uh, there has been a significant improvement in financial and banking regulation. The area which is actually uh, least, most suspect uh, in terms of improvement according to the indicators that we have, is in fact the whole area of governance and corruption. Um, and there, uh, it seems that, and, and uh, Kemal or, or, or Bill may, may have more to add here, uh, but uh, uh, in the area of governance and corruption, it's very, and it may be a measurement issue, it may be we don't have those indicators long enough, but it's very difficult to see, see big changes uh, over the 10, 20 year, uh, the 10, 20 year period. And that's very difficult to find in the indicators. Uh, and anecdotally, also, it seems like uh, uh, this remains a, uh, a, a very, very important issue uh, across, across many countries. Uh, so, uh, I am not going to express uh, any evidence-based uh, confidence that this is an issue that is resolved quickly. Um, 
If it's resolved, it's going to take a long time. It's certainly, certainly in the industrial countries that it's taken a long time to come from, you know, the, anecdotally, a lot of corruption 50, 60, 70, 80 years ago to modest corruption today or a different type of corruption. Uh, the other point I'll say is that, I, and I hate to say it, is that, uh, you know, you still seem to get a lot of girls in corrupt countries. And, uh, um, you know, whatever it is that corruption does, uh, for example, in China, uh, which is, has a lot of corruption, or India, which has a lot of corruption, it does not seem to be so extreme that it stops growth. So that's, uh, yeah. yeah. So the question, yeah. I, I, think, I think this is a very interesting conversation. So first reaction is, there, there is, we don't know really because measurements of this issue by definition are very hard. And we call it governance, but it's a more, uh, more complicated thing. So we don't know. What we know is that countries that are perceived widely and universally perceived as highly corrupt, that has not hurt their growth rates. But your very good point is, yeah, that may be good for growth, but it's very, it's, it's terrible for income distribution. Came up. Well, I think that's true. Uh, and you know, that, that, is, that is partly contributing to the uh, worsening of the income distribution. But I would like to add one more point here in terms of the definition of corruption. I mean, I think corruption narrowly defined is illegal activity, uh, you know. But there's also the capture of the legal system by special interests, which is not corruption, which is not illegal. But, you know, the fact that private equity income in the US for people who make billions of dollars is treated as long-term capital gain and is only taxed at 15%, um, you know, is an, is an example of, of capture of the political system by special interests. I don't think it can be justified by any economic or social arguments. So when we, um, so I think the problem goes beyond corruption. It goes to the, you know, who is able to capture regulatory tax uh, arrangements and so on. And here, I would say that the advanced countries have as big as big problems as as the uh, as the emerging markets. Mike, yeah, I, I think those are very fair and profound points. I think one of the most under-researched uh, areas uh, is what competition does as an anti-corruption device uh, to elbow out the crony, phony capitalists and their bureaucratic friends and their political uh, subjects. Uh, when I went to Geneva for this WTO job, um, first non-European, um, my number one target was to see what we could do to assist China into the WTO, into a rules-based system. It wasn't the round, actually, although it was, the round was important. I saw that as actually far more fundamental to the future. And that is why in this area, um, and I failed on this too, uh, to get government procurement pr uh, projects up, uh, transparency there, etc. Uh, that is fundamental. Uh, to it, and I can think of a, a number of other areas in trade agreements where people can use uh, membership of the WTO or the agreements to staircase um, good practices, good standards up. In the same way as you know, joining the European Union means you need to move on human rights, labour rights, and have certain standards and values uh, before you can join. So it's it's a pretty fundamental question. Uh, the more uncomfortable one um, is the one just raised where special interests in wealthy countries and poor countries can get together to uh, rort, rent uh, the process, whether they uh, uh, control sugar or tobacco or you know, special product entries into a country. I mean, um, if you take sugar in this country, uh, the cost to the consumer here cost of jobs, the cost of working families is tremendous. Outside, the cost uh, to the poorest producers of sugar in the Caribbean and Africa, uh, the story of cotton is equal. Um, none dare call it corruption. Uh, 
special interests uh, provide outcomes that in other countries would be called something else. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, Ambassador speaking, I'm... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, question, and then I will give uh, Uri and Bill a chance to sum up their points of view. We can we have a mic here, please. Hello, uh, Merrill Smith, Independent. Uh, just first an observation, I think the, the problems with corruption are not only intrinsic in that one party is extracting rents from everybody else, that are obviously contributes to inequality, but perhaps more profoundly uh, corruption, especially this capture, regulatory capture issue, undermines uh, people's confidence in dirigiste de methods of addressing income inequality. If you believe it's going to be corrupted, you, you won't support any uh, governmental actions uh, to help the poor. That does not necessarily apply to competition, though, but that can be gamed as well, sometimes. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, but actually, oh, and, and uh, to, to point to a specific example in the United States, you're absolutely right. You know, education lifts, you know, the unskilled from poverty. It's a great equalizing thing. However, in the United States, we've, we've developed an education bubble by wrongly, uh, well, excessively subsidizing education regardless of the capacities of the students or the validity of the majors to where we have this incredibly expensive and almost worthless uh, higher education uh, system, which is, uh, and I, I, could, I could see that being magnified if one took the wrong lessons and said, okay, we must do the same thing everywhere in the world. My question is, is another little paradox, like the paradox of corruption and growth, and that's Mexico. Uh, I noticed Mexico rises into the top seven on your chart and when it's, where it's nowhere before. Um, and indeed, Mexico has had like 5% growth lately, of great economic growth. And yet, parts of Mexico are almost in state failure. I mean, there's almost narco war going on in certain areas. And even those areas are growing as well. I mean, it's a paradox, I think. It's the, one of the things that you would think would um, inhibit growth. Uh, and yet, it's not happening. It's a, it's a, is this a counterexample, or are we, do we just have the wrong ideas about which po policies are more growth-inducing, like corruption or even lawfulness? Uh, give us your final comments or, uh, and answers to yes, that question. Yeah. yeah, this has been a remarkably useful discussion, I think, particularly because it's highlighted uh, questions that we didn't deal very well with in the book. And just to end on a somewhat more hopeful note, um, I think you have to, when you think about institutions and domestic policies and the challenges these countries face, you have to recognize that they are going through an extraordinary process where they've telescoped the kind of change that occurred in the advanced countries over the century into a few decades. And as this process goes forward, you can hope that eventually the changes in the institutions and the strengthening of policies that occurred in the advanced countries could also occur but it's just going to take more time because it takes a lot more time to do those things than it does um, to do certain policy issues like, like macro policy or to, uh, to free up prices. So uh, hopefully the future will be, will be better than the picture that uh, we see now. Yeah, thank you very much. And I also found the uh, discussion very, uh, very instructive and uh, uh, I hope Kemal and I will have more discussions on income distribution in, uh, in months to come. Uh, the, uh, um, uh, the, the main point I wanted to conclude with was to pick up uh, Moises' challenge that, uh, you know, our forecasts are wrong. I'm, I'm used to dealing with this question because for 17 years I was responsible for forecasting at the World Bank. And... Uh, <laughs> And I can show Moises later uh, the forecast that uh, uh, we made when I first started uh, at the World Bank in 92, 93, 94, when we had 10-year uh, growth rates for the developing countries of 5.2%, uh, I remember exactly. And, uh, and we were challenged then that we were crazy. And, uh, and in fact, uh, uh, not, not over any two-year period, but over... Uh, a 10-year period, by and large, those forecasts uh, been pretty much you know, on the mark, maybe uh, underestimating a little bit. Uh, so when you ask me 
uh, am I confident about, uh, about the projections uh, that we put forward? Uh, my answer is uh, uh, I'm certainly not confident about the projections over any two to three year period, number one. Uh, number two, I have no doubt uh, that there will be many accidents along the road, including financial crisis, uh, possibly uh, protectionist spats, um, and uh, 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 recessions, uh, etc. I have no doubt about that, um, and, and that they will slow uh, growth. But my judgment is that uh, uh, the fundamental uh, processes uh, uh, and changes that are outlined in the book are actually going to be very robust. And I say that uh, based, on, uh, based on the belief that the uh, fundamental forces uh, that are driving this process are uh, historical. I mean, they are deep, deep forces. They uh, are driven, disintegration and growth is driven by uh, technology. Now, one thing that's fairly sure is once you've discovered a vaccine or a weapon or a, or a uh, uh, transport technology, you don't forget it. You don't lose it. You, you know, certainly not in this world, in this highly integrated, uh, connected world. Uh, so, uh, so what is driving this process is uh, uh, the spread, and to a very large degree, the spread of technologies that are already there, that are already there, and that are, uh, are, are being uh, widened in their, uh, in their use. And the other thing that's driving this process is some need for freedom. Uh, I call uh, the opening up uh, integration into the global economy as the exercise of a freedom. Uh, is the exercise of a freedom to trade, a freedom to invest, a freedom to move uh, to other parts of the world. That's another uh, fundamental uh, driver of this, uh, of this process. So, uh, I think that it will be slowed uh, by some of these accidents, but the process will not be stopped and the essential lines uh, of uh, what is in the book will manifest themselves. I will make one caveat in closing. Uh, what w the one thing that really worries me uh, uh, in terms of the long-term projection is uh, uh, the climate change issue. Uh, because the climate change issue is, uh, is, uh, is fundamental both in the sense that it is unprecedented, that it could change the whole context, not just economic but political, uh, within which we operate. Uh, but it is also, uh, by almost by definition, a, uh, a process that is, cannot be managed by markets. It cannot be managed by markets. And this goes back to Kemal's point. Uh, this is a process where the externalities are so enormous, set out in the book and in other, uh, many other excellent treatises, uh, are so enormous that there is no way uh, that, the, that the market themselves are going to deal with it. And so somewhere, uh, if the science is correct, and I believe it's correct, uh, that process has to be negotiated. And uh, if we fail to do that, then not in the next 10 years, and probably not in the next 20, but before the horizon of this book is completed, we could be confronting a very serious issue that could uh, undermine the process. Thank you very much for an excellent uh, summing up of the book and our conversation. Uh, Juggernaut, How Emerging Markets Are Reshaping Globalization by Uri Dadush and Bill Nash is an excellent book that brought us here to discuss it with the wonderful contributions of Mike Moore and Kemal Dervis and all of you. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs>